The scripture we're going to be working from today comes from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. It says, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple, of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This passage has been heavy on my heart all week long. If you don't know, this week we finally return to in person worship again. And I'd written three or four different sermons, but none of them felt right for this moment, this moment when we can finally be together again. And maybe that's why I've had such a hard time connecting with this story this week. Because it is a gathering, a, a re-gathering of God's people. Every year, Jewish folks from all over would return to Jerusalem for Passover, the biggest, most important holiday in the Jewish faith. And every year, they'd come early to the temple, the place of God's presence on earth to purify themselves, to, to ready themselves for this important festival. Faithful people, devoted pilgrims coming, some from far away, after having been apart, some for as long as a year, back together in a sacred space. Do you feel the similarities yet? And if that's all this story was, wouldn't that be a perfect story to tell today? Wouldn't that make for a beautiful welcome back as we are gathered together again, preparing ourselves for our biggest, most important holiday of the year? But that is not the way the story goes, is it? Not this time. Not this year. Year after year of the same old rituals and the same old preparations, Jesus disrupts all of that to say this is not the way. Rather than praise the faithfulness and devotion of his fellow pilgrims, Jesus starts flipping tables and driving out everyone and everything, people and animals alike. So what's got Jesus so peeved? This story appears in all four Gospels. But out of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, this version from John is by far the most detailed. And I think the answer to that question is in the details. It says, he found there in the temple merchants bustling among their animals, selling cattle, sheep, and doves for the ritual sacrifices. Because if you were coming from a far away distance, it was nearly impossible to bring your own livestock to sacrifice. So this was a service the temple provided for your convenience. Leave your own animals at home. 
You can buy new ones right here. Of course, instead of the regular price, this was more like buying popcorn at a movie theater or peanuts at a ballpark or drinks at a music festival. A little bit of a markup because they knew you couldn't get it anywhere else. And without an animal, no sacrifice. And without a sacrifice, no Passover. Then there were the money changers, fervently counting coins and exchanging Roman currency, the denarii, for their own temple-approved shekels. Even though everyone lived in the Roman Empire, even though everyone used Roman currency every other day of the year, the denarii had a graven image on it. The denarii had an image of Caesar on it, so it couldn't be used to pay the temple tax. And you had to pay the tax to pay the priest to do the sacrifice. But one denarii didn't equal one shekel. No, one denarii got you half a shekel. That's called inflation. <laughs> and people paid it because they had to. People did it because they had to, because without it, no sacrifice. And without a sacrifice, no Passover. So they did what they had to do, no matter the cost. They did what they had to do to stay faithful and true. And maybe we could just stop right there because, of course, Jesus would be upset about corruption and greed. Of course, Jesus would have a problem with well-meaning people being taken advantage of, especially in the name of God. But I think that's what made Jesus so angry that day, not because people were doing what was faithful and true, but because they thought they were doing what was faithful and true. They believed that this was what was expected of them. They believed that this was the only way, but Jesus disrupts all these expectations and says, this is not the way. And then the text says some peculiar things in this version of the story. Once again, John drops in a few more details that none of the other gospels tell us. It says in verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. That's a direct quote from Psalm 69, the same psalm that insists that a song of praise is more pleasing to God than any ox or bull with horns or hooves. You don't need any of that other stuff. A song of praise or thanksgiving or joy is more pleasing to God than any ritual or rite. And then, then after being confronted by the religious leaders about, you know, all that table flipping stuff, Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Greek word that gets used here is actually sanctuary. The, the inner room of the temple, where the presence of God is said to reside. He said, destroy this sanctuary, and in three days I'll raise it up. And everyone seems confused by this, but in verse 21 it says, of course, he wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about his, his body. You see, according to John, Jesus' body is the sanctuary of God's presence on earth. Did you catch that? Jesus' body is the sanctuary of God's presence on earth. Let me say it another way. The body of Christ is the sanctuary of God's presence. The body of Christ is. And who is the body of Christ. You are. You are the sanctuary of God's presence in the world, not the temple in Jerusalem, 
Not the room we call the sanctuary at 1300 Edgewood Drive in Lima, Ohio. Not the pews or the carpet or the stained glass windows, but you, you, dear people, are the body of Christ. You are the sanctuary of God's presence in the world. And that, that is supremely important because what that means is that God is not confined to a building or a room, but is just waiting to be unleashed in you and through you for the sake of the world. And that's a truth that God has been telling us over and over again and again. Later on in John chapter 14, Jesus drives that point home when he says, I, I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Throughout all of scripture and throughout all of time, before the first temple was even built, the presence of God was always found with and among God's people in you, in me, and especially in us. This space that you and I worship in is not sacred because of any of the, the stuff in it. It's sacred because the body of Christ is in it. And since we're in it, we don't need any of that other stuff. Because we are the sanctuary of God's presence on earth and the presence of God cannot be contained. The presence of God won't be relegated to a room. The presence of God can't be held by any four walls. Instead, God's presence tears down walls. Instead, it drives out those who would use it or exploit it. Instead, it flips the tables of power and privilege and says, that's not the way. Instead, Jesus says, I am the way. Tear, people of God, again and again, we have been shown the way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in this week. If you've been blessed by this ministry and feel led to support Zion and our mission to welcome all people, to grow as followers of Jesus, and to serve all creation, then I invite you to go to our website now, zionlima.org, and click on the Give Online tab where you can set up a one-time or recurring gift. Without your generosity, this and so many other ministries would not be possible. And we're counting on you now more than ever. However you choose to support or participate in our mission, I thank you.